anyway, really what I wanted to do, we'll have the slides there, but really what I wanted to do today is wildly over-extrapolate from my own experience as a developer uh, and the developers I know. And then you guys can tell me if it seems like it resonates with the experiences that you've had. Good seconds. I think that would be able to do it. Uh, and so I, as uh, the, the nice gentleman who introduced me said, I work at a lot of different places. Uh, I'm editor in chief by Triple E Software. I work at a research company with an unpronounceable name. That's even better. Uh, at faculty at the University of Maryland. And the, the one common thread among all those things is I spend a lot of time worrying about, well, A, how do you train the next generation of software engineers? And, and B, how do you survive as a software engineer when, my God, the ground underneath you is changing all the time and technology is moving faster and faster? So I spent a lot of time thinking about how is the job description changing over time. And if, since I had to pick one thing to talk about in 15 minutes, my vote for the most important shift, at least today, and I might have a different opinion tomorrow, is that developers need to be more and more cognizant of not only all that technical stuff that goes on, but the business decisions that's, that's driving it at the same time. Uh, so to whatever extent it used to be true that developers could kind of sit off on the side and do the interesting technical things and not worry about business decisions, I, I don't know of any places where that's true anymore. And what makes it worse is that not only do we have all these business decisions to make and the technical stuff to do, but there's not enough time in the day to do everything that we want to do with our code anyway. So when I develop code, I tend to be one of those people that never wants it to go out of my, out of my hands, out to the wider world until, until it's perfect. And I tend to think that perfectionists are somewhat overrepresented among software engineers. And, and again, you can tell me if I'm wrong on that one. But, we don't have the time to do everything, so trade-offs have to be made. So how do we, how do we decide uh, where to spend our time? Uh, and to, to kind of grapple with that decision, I've really been loving recently. Uh, technical debt is a metaphor that Ward Cunningham actually came up with back in 1992. I didn't realize it was so old. And it seems to be hitting some peak of popularity lately. I mean, I see it all over the place nowadays. Uh, and the reason I like it so much is that what Ward has given us is a way of saying, that, geez, that, yes, there's all those change requests out there that I haven't gotten to yet, and there's all those things I personally want to do to the code, be able to refactor it, make it better structure, make it cleaner. Uh, and I'm not a bad person just because I haven't gotten to all those things. So technical debt metaphor says, um, on occasion, I'm going to trade off some of these long-term goods, you know, things like refactoring, like making the code nice and maintainable and easy to read, whatever it might be, in order to achieve a short-term goal, such as just getting the darn thing out the door, uh, being able to deliver on time. And of course, the nice thing about the debt metaphor is that, well, it helps me recognize that I do these things for a reason. Sure, I, I do these trade-offs. But you know, just like any current financial debt, there's interest that has to be paid. So if I trade off some of these things, well, it's going to be harder to maintain. I'm going to spend more time getting aggravated, uh, dealing with unstructured code and all the rest of it. Okay. So for our purposes today, anyway, a simple definition is, let's say the technical gap is just the, the technical debt is the gap between making a change perfectly the way we'd like to, perhaps, and making the change work. You know, so doing the duct tape solution. And as, if, if you're a house owner, you probably know that duct tape is a wonderful thing. Uh, but it makes you feel a little guilty if you use it for everything. Okay, so technical, that's a great theory. And I often hear, well, it doesn't really show up in practice. So what I did was I put a bunch of quotes up here uh, that come from projects I've worked on or projects that our collaborators have worked on. And I chose these specifically because they're ones that have come up on just about every project I've ever been on in my life. Um, hopefully these resonate with you. If no one else has ever seen anything like this, I may not want to know about it. That would be a little too depressing to me. But I tend to think that this phrase is like, well, it's okay for now, but we're going to refactor it later. Uh, you know, there's a part of the code here where I know it's working okay now, but for God's sake, don't touch it because I know it's going to break if I do. Uh, you know, the comments in the code that say, um, you know, to do fix me, this should be fixed before the release, and you look at the date that comment went in there, and it's like a decade old, maybe. Uh, so again, hopefully these things resonate, I see a couple smiles, I feel better. <laughs> people, people, other people have these problems too. Uh, and, but again, the point here is that these are all things that get done. You know, we, we deal with these things on a day-to-day -day basis. They are markers for things that we would like to do, being the perfectionists that we are. Maybe if we ever get the time. And I think many of us have kind of an informal list of things that I'm going to do someday in the back of my head. And so the tragedy of the thing is that someday doesn't really come. So, so what do we do with these things that they're, they're hanging out there? Do I worry about them? Do I not? How do I take my time and say, OK, am I going to retire those things now, or am I going to add new functionality and make the user happier? 
So one of the, the points that's been made, and uh, I, I wish this was something I could say that I came up with, but it, Frank uh, Bushman of Siemens has said it much better than so, you know, a recent article that he had on it. Uh, you know, he made the point that, well, you know, business considerations have to drive. Do I put time on to getting rid of my debt, or do I put time on to getting the functionality out there and getting the next to these stuff? Okay, so it, you know, I at least have to think about who the business stakeholders are uh, in order to make that decision, or at least have proxies for them. <coughs> Uh, you know, technical aspects should influence, but they're not the only driver uh, for whether I put my time onto these things or not. The other point about technical debt is, you know, a lot of times I tend to think of it as a refactoring, because that tends to be the thing that I always want to do and never get time. But technical debt also shows up in the, in the form of documentation debt. You know, geez, I need to document this thing, or the documentation is so out of date, I haven't gotten around to updating it. Um, Maybe testing debt, you know, I know I haven't really tested it quite as well as I want to, but we're going to skate on thin ice for a while and we'll survive. Um, you know, there's a lot of different flavors of debt, if I can mix the metaphors that way. So one of the things that Frank did, the reason I really like his article so much, is that he had a, a quote where he, he's done the math. You know, he's looked at a number of different systems that he's worked on, and he says, you know, surprisingly, the calculation reveals that sometimes it is better to incur the debt and then pay it off later. And when I read that, it was, it was insightful. It was also kind of depressing. I thought, yeah, I really wanted that easy, simple solution that said, no, good code always pays for itself. And wouldn't that be a nice bumper sticker? I can teach that in the classes. The students will remember that, and I can beat them over the head with a nice, simple thing that way. But, you know, again, he, Frank has actually taken the time to look at it and said, you know, it makes sense to go into debt. You know, I can get a good short-term thing uh, out at the, at, the, uh, at the expense of putting off some of the things I really want. So, now here's another scenario, and tell me if this is something that you've come up with in the day practice. So there's some debt out there that's been driving me crazy. Uh, I need to go get some time off to work on it, so I have to go to management and say, geez, I really want to take some time to refactor the code. And the first thing management, of course, does is turn around and say, well, let's take the time away from the things we really want to do, which is cramming in more functionality and getting the next release out. You know, I think one of the things that often goes on in the back of management's mind if I could make a broader generalization. Uh, you know, is it, do developers do tend to be perfectionists. And darn it, these guys always want to go out and perfect their code. They're going to spend time on getting something even better, even nicer looking code, and the customer's never really going to see the difference. And I, I have to say, I've been on both sides of this equation, because I've actually been the manager on a couple projects where we get coders working for me. And as soon as they came to me with a question like that, it, you know, it was one of, those where you, one of those moments where you start um, talking like your parents, and, just cringe because of that. But of course, that's the first thing you say. Oh, you know, you're, you're messing up my life. I want to get more functionality out. Uh, so I, I think it's a reasonable question. Uh, I think the only way that developers ever win that argument is having some kind of experience or, or data. You know, data in the sense that at least I can point to a similar thing that we did before, and I can tell you how much pain and aggravation it caused us because I wasn't able to retire that yet. So winning the argument, at least from our, the point of view of a developer who wants to take the time, I think requires us to be a little reflective. And reflective, you know, kind of looking and being analytical about the job that we're doing uh, and how well we're doing it and what kind of results that we're getting over time. Uh, requires us to take some time out and articulate what's quality mean for me on my project. Because for sure, no two projects I've ever worked on uh, had the same definition of quality. You know, does quality for us mean that we're trying to deliver things quickly to market and we're trying to speed things up? Uh, does it mean quality? Are we trying to do a product line type of approach where I have to worry about both the cleanness and the maintainability of the code? Uh, if I can articulate quality, then the next thing I ask people to do is to come up with some rules. You know, so if, if I have an understanding of what quality means for me, how do I know if we're achieving it or not? And it could be something relatively straightforward. I mean, to my mind, a good rule is anything that's, that's expressible. You know, I can say something about what I expect to see out there in the code base or in the documentation. Uh, it's testable, you know, so ideally it's something where I can automate something and have it run out there and analyze my own code and tell me something. Uh, and it's helpful. So even if it's not perfect, if it helps me understand something about my code, I think I can out of it. And the thing I always say there is it's amazing to me that as, as developers, we spend so much time analyzing other things for other people, and we so rarely kind of turn that same set of skills and, an and analytics back onto our own day-to-day -day activity and see what we're coming up with and what our code looks like. Uh, and, and for God's sake, a rule does not have to be formally uh, fully automated. That is, if I ever say that here's something where I'm going to turn the crank and it's going to find all my debt for me, uh, I, I think the realm of interesting things that look like that is really small. So I don't really tend to believe that. But 
it's something that I can run these rules over time, you know, again, because there's some automation in there. I can investigate what's true in my code and, and whether or not I'm happy with those results. And the, the, the other thing I always like to say is, you know, we're in this mindset where all the time we use automated regression tests to monitor code behavior. So why not think of doing something similar to look for other code properties? Like, you know, could I get a proxy that looks at maintainability or readability or how up-to-date my documentation is? Run those things over time and give me some quick, some quick insight into the code. Okay, so let me give two examples here. Uh, this is complicated. Let me explain this. Uh, and actually, uh, Grady gave me the perfect setup for this because this was this was a really fun project we were on. It was dark and uh, We were working with a bunch of high energy physicists, actually. Uh, and, and what they were doing was these kind of massively parallel supercomputer simulations of high energy physics. So you had a bunch of people that really knew that domain. Uh, they were paired up with a bunch of computer scientists that understood how you parallelize these algorithms so you make use of all the thousands of nodes you have available. Their business goal, in the sense you can call the business goal, was I want to get the most science out of the money that I have. So I don't want to spend time doing a lot of coding or fixing coding bugs if I could you know, get away with it. And the way that they were surviving was that they put barriers. So the big rectangles here, what we're looking at is a representation of the whole code base. Then the big rectangles are the packages, and the smaller rectangles are the classes within there. Okay. And what they had done was put up barriers. So they said that the, 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 the Sheldon Coopers of the world, you know, the high energy physicists, are only supposed to be out here in the, uh, the, the gray packages. So that's where all the high energy physics code is going to be uh, stored. And the computer scientists are supposed to work in these orange packages, and that's where all the library calls that handle parallelization is going to be. Okay. So that was uh, that was a pretty good rule. You know, they said that we're only effective when we can keep these two things separate. So okay, let's let's figure out how we can test that. Well, we know what all the library calls are going to look like. So essentially, what we did was just wrote some easy Perl uh, scripts to go out there and do just a simple pattern matching. You know, where do I see these library calls coming up? And then what I've done here is I've colored things in. So the darker the color of green, the more of those library uh, parallel I/O calls I can find. Okay. And what you find that's good is that within the, the orange code where the computer scientists are supposed to be working, I see a lot of these library calls. Yes, that's great. We've done a good job of, kind of, uh, of um, putting some of that and getting our arms around it. Uh, but you can see out here where the physicists are working, where the Sheldon Coopers of the world are working, there's, you know, there's a little bit of bleed over. You know, there's some of these library calls around there. Now that we have that image in our heads, I think the last thing we want is Sheldon Cooper dealing with our <laughs> parallel, uh, parallel supercomputing calls. Okay. So this isn't the answer. You know, maybe there's a good reason why some of this bleed over happened. And we can go you know, look at whether or not we want to spend time fixing it. But at least it gives us an easy way of tackling the problem. You know, and starting to understand how much, uh, how much of the technical debt do I have? And how much of this thing should I be making cleaner? Uh, and what am I going to do? Secondly, this is an easier example. We had a small company that we work with that were doing a, a software product line approach. As they were training out a lot of applications and happened to look more or less similar to each other. Uh, and one of the things that was causing them a lot of grief was if somebody ever left the team and they went to plug in somebody new, uh, they were having a really hard time coming up to speed on these things that should look pretty similar, actually. So they took some time. Uh, they actually instituted a, a standard architecture that people were supposed to follow. Uh, so now there's a great rule. I can go out and do some analysis of the code base. I can run some analysis tools to see where uh, where packages that shouldn't be talking to each other are, or where packages that are that should be talking to each other are. Okay. So I can, I can do that analysis. And then what we had done was actually automated a uh, a tool that went through all the versions of the code into the repository, uh, pulled each one out of version control, compiled it to the analysis, and then ran on from there. So what I'm showing here is just a, uh, a timeline analysis of all the packages in the system. And if it lights up red, that means it's not conforming to the, the reference architecture. Okay. So again, this doesn't give us the answer. It just kind of points us to where some technical debt might be. But now I can go have the discussion with my manager that says, you know, if these things are really dead, have we been having trouble with those places? You know, do we see a lot of change requests? Do we spend more time fixing defects there? You know, is, is there an interest that I'm paying off that maybe I wasn't aware of? And if not, yeah, if yes, then, then good. I've got something good. I've got some insight. And if not, let's move on maybe and find something else to worry about. So let's put our effort wherever we really need the most good. Okay. So in a, in a quick talk, hopefully I've given you two kind of useful examples. Uh, I've not, not bored anyone to death along the way. Uh, one thing I hope you don't take away from this talk is that it's all about doing static analysis. Of the uh, because what we've seen is that every team that I've ever worked with has picked up some analysis tool found that there's too many false positives and we start to turn things off and not pay attention to it over time. 
But rather, what I hope I've left you with is maybe an idea to spend a little bit of time being reflective, you know, thinking about what, what does quality really mean to our team? What are the things that we'd like to prioritize? Uh, you know, what are the, the, the rules that should be true? What are the, the, how do I find the technical that, that, might not, that might still be out there that I haven't known about? Uh, and then pick some tools or create some if I find that there's a gap and there's something that really gives me the answer uh, to go out there and find it better. And then the last thing I'd like to leave you with is having done that, think about uh, sharing and discussing. So bring an experience like that to the end conference next year. I think that would be a great talk. Uh, send an experience like that to IEEE software because we love to publish experience reports from the field that way. And I think that doing this kind of sharing about what works for me and what am I trying to do with it uh, is one of the best ways that we really progress as an engineering field. So hopefully that's a, a compelling reason for, for people to share and discuss. And that's the end. So. Thank you.